ladies and gentlemen, exploring a just peace in a fragmented world is a very timely uh, topic. The world is indeed very much fragmented. And most of the institutions in the world and we are member are under risk. Terrorism, irregular migration, humanitarian crisis, poverty, and xenophobia and hatred are on the rise, and inequalities are everywhere. Without addressing inequalities, we cannot talk about social justice anywhere, neither in Turkey nor in neighborhood or beyond. And international organizations fail to deal with the actual threats. Geopolitics is back, prevention is weak, and conflict resolution is even weaker. That means there is need to adopt a win-win approach and reform the rules-based international system. Strengthening international institutions is an important aspect of this agenda. And the UN must fulfill its global role to serve humanity. And the UN's structure, working methods, as well as procedures, rules of procedures, must be reformed to better respond to the global challenges. That is the expectation of our societies today. And we support UN Secretary General's pledge in that respect. And the reform should also include the UN Security Council system. That's why my president has been emphasizing and underlining that world is bigger than five. It's not an empty motto. And the United Nations should be reform itself. And UN is not meeting the expectation of today's world. Forget about the UN. Our regional organizations are also not meeting the expectations of our societies in Europe, particularly. And European Union is one of them. Therefore, European Union and the Council of Europe and the OEC and the others should also reform themselves. When I was president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, the reform was my priority. It was the priority at the same time of the Secretary General, who is still Secretary General of the organization, Torbjörn Jagland. And we didn't reform only the Parliamentary Assembly, but even the European Court of Human Rights, and which is more effective right now. Therefore, reform is an ongoing process. We need to continue reforming this organization. And while we are facing all these problems in our neighborhood, Turkey cannot just sit back and watch. Therefore, the principle of the, today's Turkey for, Turkish foreign policy is enterprising and humanitarian foreign policy. And we must take initiatives and employ hard and soft instruments of power to implement the enterprising and humanitarian foreign policy in our neighborhood and beyond. And we take active roles in prevention and peaceful resolutions of the conflicts. Syria is one example and the immediate example. The deal, the memorandum that we signed with Russians on Idlib didn't only prevent the humanitarian catastrophe, but also prevented a mass, another mass flow of migrants to Turkish border as well as towards Europe. And now there is a, another window of opportunity for political solution. Without Idlib deal, we wouldn't be able to do that. Because otherwise there will be no opposition and there will be no negotiations between the opposition and the regime for constitution or for a political uh, solution, which is the best solution for Syria. Humanitarian assistance and the solving the problems of the people where they are living is so essential. And Turkey has been very successful in that regard. And I am 
you know, so honored to repeat that Turkey is the most generous country in the world right now. Our humanitarian and development assistance reached 8.1 billion US dollar in 2017. And second is United States, and their humanitarian and development assistance amounted 6.7 billion dollars. In 2016, they were at the top, and with 6.3 billion dollars. And our humanitarian assistance was six billion dollars in 2016. So you can see the achievements and the progress that we have made. And we will continue supporting the vulnerable people in all over the world. And we have spent $32 billion for the Syrian refugees, only Syrian refugees living in Turkey, not the others. And we have another more than 500,000 refugees and migrants from different parts of the world, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from African countries, and even beyond. Now we are signing the readmission agreements with the source countries. That is another story. But here, what I am trying to say that migration is a, one of the challenges that we are facing today. Even though we don't have world war today, more than 65 million people had to leave their homes for this reason or that reason. Forcibly, some of them. But now they face other problems where they are living now. Nevertheless, we have to deal this problem. And no country can uh, alone solve this problem. Therefore, full cooperation is, is essential. That is exactly what we are doing right now with European Union and European countries and the transit countries with Greece. And it has three aspects. We need to prevent irregular migration. To do so first, we have to fight smugglers. And we have made a lot of achievements there. And more than 26,000 smugglers we have captured in Turkey in Istanbul, in Izmir, also along the coast, Asian coast mainly, and also in Edirne region. And we should promote control migration. This is exactly what we are doing with the European Union, control migration. And despite all these problems and the oppos opposition of the many leadership in Europe, thanks to the uh, Madame Merkel's leadership, and also Prime Minister Rutte, we signed this agreement during the Dutch presidency of the European Union Commission. EU has resettled almost 20,000 Syrians in return to what we receive from Greek islands. Now, Greek has some problems to send them back. That is their own problem, but now it's also affecting the, uh, the other uh, so, uh, host countries. We need to deal another big challenge in our countries, in Europe, which is xenophobia, racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, any sort of phobia, I mean. They are all on rise. And maybe Steph can tell us more because one political party in his country is increasing its support at every election. And they have to deal that. I think we need better Turkey-EU relations. This, and to do so, we need to create more positive atmosphere. This is exactly what we are doing now. Particularly after unilateral acts and decision of the United States, we more defend multilateralism, but effective multilateralism. For effective multilateralism, we need better cooperation. Therefore, I would like to thank uh, Steph uh, here in front of you for his good visit and the good talks that uh, we uh, have been having since he arrived. Thank you very much.
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like first of all to thank uh, my friend Mevlut Cavusoglu for inviting me for this important forum today. The first, after two decades of unipolarity, we now live in a multipolar world with economic power shifting towards the east and the south as old alliances try to adapt to the new reality. It's a world where multilateralism and the system of international cooperation set up after World War II are under pressure. And where the principle of might makes right is consequently in danger of gaining the upper hand. It's a world where states are no longer the single dominant factors at play. Non-state actors are growing more and more influential. And the rise of ISIS is a harrowing example of this. And Turkey has borne a disproportionately heavy burden in this regard, unfortunately. Second, it's a world where classic threats remain, but new, often undetectable hybrid threats have entered the mix. Cyber threats, meddling by foreign actors, and fake news, to name but a few. Third, we live in a world where people have become increasingly mobile. And this has benefited many, but it can lead to disruptive irregular migration patterns when not handled responsibly. And Turkey knows this all too well as host to an astonishing three and a half million Tur Syrian refugees with all challenges this entails. And we truly appreciate this tremendous humanitarian effort. And by relocating refugees to the Netherlands and providing financial support to the EU facility for refugees in Turkey, we are happy we can help in this effort. Let me run through five elements that I and my country believe are essential in our fragmented world. I come from a small, open and wealthy country that is heavily dependent on trade. Trade with our partners, both close and far away. A country that remembers the devastation of at least one world war and the pain of decades of rebuilding. A country that has had first-hand experience of what happens when the international order breaks down. And a country that, like many, many others, has a tremendous interest in preserving international law and rules-based international legal order. And when I say rules-based international order, I mean that in the broad sense of the term, encompassing all various structures of international corporations that benefit us so greatly. Structures of cooperation where countries come together because they prefer to meet in conference halls rather than on the battlefield and because they believe in working together towards common goals. For Europe, this has resulted in peace through integration. For NATO, this has meant peace through pooling resources and common defense. And for the United Nations, this has led to peace through cooperation and the development of a rules-based international order. Or, as the UN Charter rightly puts it, the conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained. My country has invested heavily in promoting a rules-based international order. Since as far back as the days of Hugo Grotius, and as host to the Hague Peace Conferences, the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, and other key international legal institutions, the Netherlands has a proud tradition of championing international law, and indeed, it is enshrined in our constitution. As the Roman writer Vergetius observed in his Re Militaris Institutia, if you want peace, prepare for war. And unfortunately, that principle is also true today. A realist like me cannot help but concede that a just peace sometimes requires more than just simply talk. We need to be ready when all other options are exhausted to use other means than words. We need to be ready to exert real pressure to hit an opponent where it hurts. After all, 
By imposing punitive sanctions, the world forced North Korea to back to the negotiating table. And in some cases, we even have to be ready to take the kind of steps we are all working hard to avoid. The threat of military action is sometimes enough. Deterrence is a major component of defense. But sometimes it's necessary to go even further. When all options have exhausted and our, our very existence is threatened, the use of military force cannot be ruled out. In extreme cases, we have to be ready to take up arms, even if we don't want to. The threat of ISIS was such a case. A 79-member coalition joined forces and managed to defeat an apocalyptic army of 30,000 fighters that was causing havoc in Iraq and Syria. And as a result, ISIS now has almost no territory left. We don't want to play the military card, but we must be prepared so to as a last resort. Since 2001, our soldiers have stood shoulder to shoulder in Afghanistan to prevent this troubled country from falling back into instability. So, just peace and security go hand in hand. But I also want to highlight the importance of rules. Even in cases where we have no other option than to take up arms, there are rules that we must follow. In order to have just peace, our use of force must also be just. We must abide by the laws of armed conflict. And even in situations of conflict, the principles of international humanitarian law must be fully respected. This brings me to my third point. Predictability breeds confidence. And confidence is the most vital component of international relations. This should never be taken for granted. I mentioned the European Union, NATO, and United Nations, but also firms like the Global Counterterrorism Forum, where 29 countries work together to tackle a shared challenge. And consider, for example, the success of the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA. Europe has stuck to the agreement that was reached. And consider also the importance of solid and predictable trade agreements with level playing fields. In the WTO framework, countries refrain from taking unilateral steps because in the long run, it's not in anyone's interest to damage the hard-fought level playing field. Building confidence by being predictable also means honoring the, the old principle of pacta sunt servanda. Rules are to be respected, internally and externally, in relation to our partners. For a country like the Netherlands, as a member of so many international forums, this means that you can count on your allies. And a clear example of this was when we provided Patriot missiles for the Turkish border to protect Turkey against attacks from Syria. And it means not shying away from reform, but reform must be constructive, and moving with the organization, not against it. But the ultimate goal of making the organization better and this goes for the UN and, of course, also for the EU and for NATO. And it means that we must be prepared to address difficult questions. In regional bodies like the European Union, we must be especially strict about issues like budgetary discipline and to ensure that there are consequences when it is not observed. It also means being consistent about accession criteria, strict and fair. This principle is true for migration as well. We will respect the UN Refugee Convention, but we will also honor our agreements on the return of irregular migrants. And finally, predictability also entails respect for human rights and our univer universality. And I would like to stress there can be no pause button for this principle. And this is why I won't stop calling on the Security Council to refer the most serious crimes to the International Criminal Court. In that connection, I welcome the recent announcement that the International Criminal Court's prosecutor has opened an investigation into the forced displacement of the Rohingya people from Myanmar. Together with Kuwait, the Netherlands has put a lot of effort into holding accountable those responsible for the atrocities there. 
And in this regard, I commend Turkey for its leadership in giving the Rohingya such a prominent place on the world's agenda. I believe that the International Criminal Court is one of the most important instruments we have for ending impunity and achieving accountability. And for that reason, as many countries as possible should become party to the Rome Statute. With 127 free states, a majority of the international community has signed up. But there are still too many states outside the fault. The important role Turkey has played in highlighting the plight of the Rohingya shows that Turkey should also be part of the International Criminal Court family. My fifth and last point is also about accountability. Because, of course, accountability is not an end in itself. It's one of the elements that makes reconciliation possible, and it is reconciliation that enables a wounded society to tap into its reserves of resilience and look to the future again, to move forward, to rebuild. Reconciliation gives us the hope of ultimately living as brothers and sisters once again. This may take generations, but we have to believe it is possible and the world must stand ready to help. 